A couple of years ago when I was in the very early stages of perhaps discerning a call to a new parish, a friend who knew the congregation sent me the profile for Bethesda by the Sea in Palm Beach. And knowing nothing about Bethesda or Palm Beach except by some vague reputation, one of my first thoughts was, I'd sure hate to be the preacher there when Jesus says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Well, the joke's on me, because here I am. Though as I've gotten to know and love this community, uninformed impressions aside, it's clearly not made up of some caricature of extreme wealth. I haven't met anyone who looks like the guy on the Monopoly board, <laughs> someone who comes to church wearing a top hat and a monocle with a big bag of cash under his arm. When you go to coffee hour, you won't meet Richie Rich, Mr. Burns, or Scrooge McDuck. Granted, if any of these characters did show up on a Sunday morning, they would be warmly welcomed at Bethesda by the sea. And perhaps I'd slip them a pledge card. But the reality is that this community has everything from billionaires to those living paycheck to paycheck and everything in between. We are an economically and geographically diverse community. But we all, what we all have in common is a commitment to following Jesus Christ as our Lord and a desire to make a difference in the world through the ministries of this church. Now, I know you think I'm just avoiding the topic at hand, so let's dig in a little bit. This whole scene is initiated by a rich young man who comes up to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him to keep all the commandments, which seems reasonable. Don't murder anyone, don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. And the young man indicates that he's checked all of these boxes. He's probably thinking, great, I'm in. But then Jesus tells him one more thing. But before he does, and this is an important detail, we hear that Jesus looked at him and loved him. So while Jesus is about to say a hard thing, his heart is overflowing with love and compassion for this young man. In fact, this is the only time in Mark's Gospel that someone is singled out as being loved by Jesus. And Jesus loves him because even with all his baggage, both literal and spiritual, he is seeking the kingdom of God. But, Jesus tells him, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. And we hear that the young man went away grieving because he had many possessions. And after the young man walks away, that's when Jesus says to the disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, before offering that comically impossible image of a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. So does this mean that the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to sell everything you own and give the money to the poor? Well, I hope not. We're not St. Francis. But this passage isn't just about donating things to goodwill, or preferably the church mouse, so that we can feel good about ourselves, or clean out our closets. It's about following Jesus. 
It's about reorienting our priorities to be more faithful disciples. That may well involve selling some of our possessions and giving the money to the poor. But it also challenges us to think about our relationship with money. Money can buy a lot of things, but it can't buy eternal life. Only faithfully following Jesus leads to the kingdom of God. Money can buy you stuff, but it can't buy you the connection and joy and peace and meaning that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And deep down, I think we all know this to be true. Because anyone who ever thought their problems would magically disappear if only they were able to buy a bigger house or a nicer car knows that this never works. You just end up having the same problems, but with leather seats. But still, this is an incredibly challenging Passage, one that we can dance around and justify all day long. We can tell ourselves the command to sell our possessions doesn't apply to all of us, but only to this one particular young man. We can tell ourselves that it only applies to really rich people. And every single one of us can point to someone who is richer than we are. We can tell ourselves that it's all just a metaphor to make a broader point about keeping our priorities in order. We can tell ourselves that if we sold all our stuff and gave the money to the poor, then the poor would be rich, and then they'd have to sell their possessions and give the money to the poor, which would then be us. <laughs> That's how I approached this in middle school. There are many ways to wriggle out of this one. And much to the delight of their congregations, preachers have been doing this for centuries, letting people off the hook. But maybe Jesus really does want us to sell everything we own and give the money to the poor. If nothing else, Jesus challenges us to decide whether we love our things more than we love God. To decide whether our three-car garage is more important to us than our faith. And in return, Jesus makes it clear that God loves you not for your supposed worth based on bank statements and worldly standards of wealth, but because you have been wonderfully made in God's image. That God's love and grace is freely offered to all who earnestly seek it. And we see that true riches are measured not by accumulation, but by disbursement. It is in giving that we receive. And it is in giving away by sharing our resources that we move ever closer to the kingdom of God. The other detail I'd like to highlight is the disciples' incredulous reaction to Jesus' interaction with this rich young man. We hear that they were perplexed and greatly astounded by it. And it's hard for us to recognize just how radical this teaching was for Jesus' first hearers. Because in the ancient world, it was a standard belief that to be wealthy was to be favored by God. The rich were considered to be the very first in line to get into heaven. There was a reason they were rich, because God had blessed them. On the other hand, to be poor or sick was a clear sign that God was punishing the person, that they had obviously sinned in some way to cause this calamity in their life. And so you had the wealthy who were respected and righteous and powerful, because they were obviously blessed by God, 
And you had the poor who were downtrodden and miserable and lacking in basic necessities because they were obviously cursed by God. That was the paradigm into which Jesus speaks about the difficulty of a rich person entering the kingdom of God. And it turned conventional wisdom right on its head, which is why the disciples were perplexed and greatly astounded at what Jesus was saying. It turned their entire world upside down. It showed them a new way, a new path. It's why Jesus spent all of this time breaking down barriers and, and being with the sick and the downtrodden and the outcast and the sinner. And so it all starts to make sense. Jesus' ministry all starts to come together. So where does that leave us? Well, I want you to know that when you are truly and authentically seeking Jesus, even if haltingly and imperfectly, Jesus will look at you and love you. He will gaze upon you with compassion and tenderness. Should you sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor? I don't know. Maybe. But I do know that Jesus invites us all to seek first the kingdom of God, to order our lives in a way that prioritizes caring for the vulnerable among us, to love God with heart and mind, and soul and strength as we walk this journey towards larger life in God's eternal care. And to remember that while we can't do this in and of ourselves, as Jesus says, with God, all things are possible.